If you think about even for those of us who are involved in the arts, I mean, I came up at a time when Toni Morrison was on the cover of Newsweek. And I can't remember the last time an African-American writer was on the cover of one of the major day glosses. Things have changed in really profound ways. Um, and I think that why these reunions, why these interventions matter so much is because despite the colossal demographic change in the country, you look at the kids that we work with, you look at the kids who are coming up, you would think that this country, its ways of representing and thinking about itself seem to come out of the 50s, yeah? I mean, I'm always struck by how if you turn the television on and you go to the goddamn movies, or if you just open up the bestseller lists, it looks like an English-speaking, all English-speaking South Africa of the 50s. I mean, literally, the profound levels of whiteness that are in circulation now are, without any question, uh, sort of a public health catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> is a society that has become so addicted to spectacular whiteness that it wouldn't know what to do without its fucking daily hit of the pipe. <laughs> <laughs> the addiction to whiteness is so profound that when you try to remove whiteness from the attic, they will attempt to either harm you <laughs> yeah, or fucking run from you as fast as possible or get from somewhere else. And it is a serious addiction. If, we, if you really don't believe that this is a country that's addicted to whiteness, I think we're living on two different planets. Because it's almost like it can't be enough. It's like, oh, 98% of all acting roles are white. Look, we need that 99 fucking percent. <laughs> Look, I was here, I'm going to do a read. Yeah, I just wanted to read. <laughs> is at a very crucial space. Yeah? White supremacy's power has enhanced in a way that I think is very difficult for most young people to get a handle on. Because white supremacy wants to extend its operations while masking them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that when one recalls in an earlier period, my god, who ever thought that I... <coughs> Those of us who grew up in the 70s would long for the 70s when people were like, I hate Latinos, and yes, I'm a racist. <laughs> such, such simple Arcadian times. But now the motherfuckers are like, I hate. I hate Latinos, but I'm not racist. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to put on a hood and burn your fucking house down and burn a fucking cross in front, and then they get incensed that you say that they're racist. <laughs> Literally, motherfuckers will pull up the hood and be like, no. <laughs> But what's, important about this, what's important about this is that any of us who are working in these fields, whether it's education or social justice, one of the extraordinary things that we're being faced with is this negative hallucination. I mean, that's what, if you were a psychiatrist, you would call a negative hallucination. That literally the denial and disavowal of the operations of racism are so intense that we spend most of our time being like, no, you fucking burning the cross with a fake AK put on is fucking racist. We can't even get beyond that. 
And certainly one of the things that I've discovered is that nothing has altered this equation like the work that educators and activists are doing in our school systems. We would be in serious <coughs> if it wasn't for the work of people like the folks here at Harvard. I mean, it's an intense thing because there is no control, right? There is no world where we can see where we would be at if we subtracted the incredible labor of the folks here gathered. But I would argue if you were able to look and see what the world, this world, would look like without your work, I think it would be an astonishment. I think it would be an astonishment. Despite where we're at, I would argue that we're doing far better than we could be, far better than we would imagine. Because in fact, so many of us are sacrificing so much, so many of us are working so incredibly hard. And so many of us are giving everything to try to create a truly democratic, truly justice-oriented, social justice-oriented society. When I was growing up, it was still the educational model. So all of us who wanted to be artists couldn't wait to get to the world. None of us were like in creative writing classes trying to get our teacher's approval. We were like, this shit is going to kill our art. <laughs> we need to get to life. Because the only thing that makes anyone's art interesting is your news of the world. And you do not get news of the world by being in institutions. And so when we were young, all my friends who were artists, we could not wait to get the fuck out of college. We were like, yo, we cannot wait to get the fuck out of here and get into the world because we know that's where our art is going to grow. And if I was going to encourage young people who are artists, I would say, guys, dudes, I beg you, don't pursue your art like it is a major in college. What you need to pursue is life. And what I mean by that is, if you're serious about being an artist, I would not major in your art. I would try to figure out how quickly to get out of your institution and go have an adventure for three, four, five years in the world. And guys, even a shitty job where nobody cares about you is a bigger adventure than being at a graduate school. <laughs> Whatever your art is, I can make you a better artist by just putting you in a crappy, shitty job for three years. The news of the world you will bring from that will be more important to us as artists than the news of the world you are going to bring from majoring in creative writing at an undergraduate program. The strength of your art is when you're engaging with the world. Radical women who are like, masculine privilege makes it impossible for men to be best. Because when they finally come for the women, the dudes will be like, I'm not feminist. <laughs> it's that woman, you remember um, The Handmaid's Tale? Yes. It's that outcome. But the one thing that men can be is they can be feminist allies. And one of the conversations that always be had is that one of the useful things that male writers could do was to draw maps of masculine interior. Yeah, but like, men can draw the insides of masculinity. And it's one of the things that I've dedicated my career to doing. People often mistake the representation of masculinity for the approval of masculinity. But you can't draw a map of masculinity without detailing the most maligned contours of that. That doesn't mean that you agree with it. So, with that said, the tutor's got to love Yeah? <laughs> People got real silent. They're like, nah. <laughs> Texas, I'm going to I'm going to Right men that don't sound sexist, even though that's all we grew up with. <laughs> yeah. So, the tutor's got to love. You're zero, and we're done. Your girl who catches you cheating, well, actually, she's your fiancé, but hey, in a bit, it just won't matter. She could have caught you with one sucia, she could have caught you with two, 
But if you're a totally batshit guero who didn't ever empty his email trash can, <laughs> she caught you with 50. <laughs> sure, over a six year period, but still, 50 fucking girls? God damn. Maybe if you had been engaged to a super open-minded Blanquita, you could have survived it. <laughs> but you are not engaged to a super open-minded Blanquita. Your girl is a badass from Salcedo who does not believe in open anything. <laughs> in fact, the one thing she swore, the one thing she warned you about that she swore she would never forgive was cheating. I will put a machete in you. <laughs> she promised. And of course you swore you wouldn't do it. You swore you wouldn't do it. You swore you wouldn't do it. And you did. She will stick around for a few months because you dated for a long, long time. Because you went through much together. Her father's death, your tenure madness, her bar exam. And because love, real love, is not so easily shed. Over a tortured six-month period, you will fly to the Dominican Republic, to Mexico, to New Zealand. You walk the beach where they filmed the piano, <laughs> something she always wanted to do, and now in penitent desperation, you give it to her. <laughs> she is immensely sad on that beach, and she walks up and down the shining sand alone, bare feet in that freezing water, and when you try to hug her, she says, don't. She stares at the rocks jutting out of the water, the wind taking her hair straight back. On the ride to the hotel, up through those wild steeps, you pick up a pair of hitchhikers, a couple so mixed it is ridiculous, and so giddy with love you want to throw them out the fucking car. <laughs> Later in the hotel, she will cry. You try every trick in the book to keep her. You write her letters. You drive her to work. You quote Neruda. <laughs> Be amazed how many motherfuckers do that. <laughs> you compose a mass email disowning all of your sucias. You block their emails. You change your phone number. You stop drinking. You stop smoking. You claim you're a sex addict. You start attending meetings. You blame your father. You blame your mother. You blame the patriarchy. You blame Santo Domingo. You find a therapist. You cancel your Facebook. You start taking Sansa classes like you always swore you would. You claim that you were sick. You claim that you were weak. It was the book. It was the pressure. And every hour like clockwork, you say that you are so, so sorry. You try it all, but one day she will simply sit up in bed and say, no more. Yeah. And you will have to move from the Harlem apartment the two of you have shared. You consider not going. You consider a squat protest. In fact, you say you won't go, but in the end, you do. For a while, you haunt the city like a two-bit ball player, dreaming of a call-up. Your phone, you phone her every day and leave messages which she does not answer. You write her long, sensitive letters which she returns unopened. You even show up at her apartment at odd hours and at her job downtown until finally her little sister calls you, the one who was always on your side. And she makes it plain, if you try to contact my sister again, she's going to put a restraining order on you. For some Negroes, that wouldn't mean shit. <laughs> You ain't that kind of Negro. <laughs> you stop. You move back to Boston. You never see her again. Thank you, guys. I'll be back. <laughs>